a shopping cart full of stuff. Do I really want all of that? Or did my shopper irrationality get the best of me? Consumers can sometimes be completely irrational, far removed from the rational, logical buyers predicted by classical economics. In this video, I'm going to show you several examples of irrational consumer behavior and the underlying principles that explain them. They are all fascinating by themselves, but being familiar with them will also help you make better marketing decisions. When making decisions, we rely on two different cognitive systems, two different ways of thinking, system one and system two. System one is intuitive and fast. System two is slow, effortful, and methodical. Most of the time we use system one. It's like an autopilot that guides us through most of our daily life. It uses little energy, is effortless, and it serves us well in the great majority of situations. System two is the pilot that takes over from the autopilot when required. Take a look at these two tables. You probably see table number two on the right appearing as more of a square than table number one on the left, which seems to be longer. Mayday, that's your autopilot failing you. If you measure them, you will see that your intuition has deceived you. They are exactly the same. When making purchase decisions, consumers rely on many heuristics or rules of thumb. These are mental shortcuts that our autopilot uses to simplify decision making. For example, consumers often assume that expensive products are of a higher quality than cheaper products. These rules of thumb simplify our thinking, but actually they are susceptible to lots of different biases. In fact, there are tons of cognitive biases. Wikipedia alone lists about 180 of them. Not all of them are equally important. I'll show you three of them that I have encountered time and again, both in my research and my consulting practice. Number one, anchoring. Everything is relative. So choosing between different products or services isn't easy. Products don't have an intrinsic objective value. Instead, we compare the relative advantage of things. Our mind evaluates objects relative to the things that surround them. Take a look at the two circles in the middle. They are both the same size, but depending on the context, the middle circle appears larger or smaller. If surrounded by smaller circles, it appears larger. If surrounded by larger circles, it appears smaller. Consumers often anchor their decision-making process to the surrounding situation instead of thinking rationally to make the best decision overall. Anchoring occurs when consumers rely too heavily on one trait or piece of information when making decisions. These anchors can be arbitrary, irrelevant, or even fake, and they cloud our decision-making. Anchoring often occurs with regards to prices, and astute marketers use this to their advantage. Probably the most common example involves putting inflated reference prices in the consumer's minds. Let's say I want to sell you my favorite coffee mug. It costs $12. Is that cheap or expensive? Hard to say. It depends on your reference price on how much you think a coffee mug usually costs. Now I'll make you a deal. This mug is now on sale. By showing you an artificial reference price of $24 on the price tag, now the mug is more likely to appear as a good deal. According to research, anchoring works particularly well if the anchor is presented first. Let's say you're a real estate agent. It would be to your advantage to show me the most expensive house first. The same goes if you try to sell me a suit. Show me the most expensive suit first. One last example. This one's from e-commerce. When selling services online, marketers frequently offer different service options, and they show these options in a pricing table side by side. It makes sense to have a luxury option with all the bells and whistles and the high price that matches it. Few consumers will go for it, but by providing this gold option as an anchor, it is much more likely that they will choose the silver option instead of the basic economy plan. And that's exactly what the marketer wants them to do. Number two, the endowment effect. Simply put, the endowment effect states that if we own something, we value it more. My house or my car are worth more to me than they are to you. Well, heck, even my favorite coffee mug is worth more to me than to you. You didn't seriously think I would sell it to you for a mere 12 bucks, right? 
we overvalue our possessions regardless of their objective market value. This is likely due to people's loss aversion. We receive pleasure from gaining and we really, really hate to lose things. It's difficult to let go of possessions. One way that marketers successfully exploit the endowment effect is by offering free trials. For example, the professional social media platform LinkedIn regularly offers me a free one-month trial of their premium subscription. The initial threshold is very low, it's free after all, but once I've upgraded, the endowment effect kicks in. I already own the premium subscription, so even if I realize that I don't necessarily need or use the additional features, it's hard to go back to the basic subscription. Loss aversion might prevent me from doing so. Let's look at another example. Here is how I market my vacation home to tourists. I appeal to their sense of virtual ownership of the house. The house is promoted on a website. The pictures we took of the house are staged so that the rooms feel lived in. The prospective guest who is visiting the website can project himself in the situation. Everything is ready for you and your family. How about a happy and relaxing breakfast in front of your sun-soaked pool? Or if you prefer romance over family, I've created that in the bedrooms as well. I've tested this out empirically and the pictures showing ownership work remarkably well. Just one caveat, I only show things and never people. That would destroy the whole illusion of virtual ownership. Number three, the framing effect. Consumers, when they're on autopilot, using system one thinking, draw different conclusions from the same information depending on how that information is presented. Alternative wording of the same information is all that is needed to cause different interpretations in the mind of the consumer. For example, a framing can be used on product labels. In an experiment, consumers were asked to evaluate packaged meat. Each consumer saw either a package with a label that stated 75% lean, or alternatively, 25% fat. You probably guessed the outcome of the experiment. 75% lean was valued significantly more positively. Same message, different framing, different results. Not only did framing influence the purchase decision, the effect persisted all the way to the consumer's dining tables. 75% lean meat even tasted better. Okay, let's spend a little more time at the dining table, but this time inside a restaurant. The influence of framing on consumer behavior also extends to the menu. Many restaurants eliminate the dollar sign in front of the price. Others eliminate decimals, so it's $15 instead of $15.00. Both representations make restaurant patrons less price sensitive. Some restaurants even spell out the prices in words instead of numbers. This may seem like the height of pretentiousness, and perhaps it is, but research has also shown that this type of framing is highly effective because it de-emphasizes the price and takes the sting out of paying. Well, at least while ordering the food. Here is one more way language is used to influence restaurant patrons. Some restaurants have turned from generic, straightforward food names to descriptive menu labels. Tender grilled free-range chicken, spice-crusted Colorado lamb loin with mango reduction, New York-style cheesecake with Godiva chocolate sauce. If this is still a framing effect or some other cognitive bias, depends on how broad or narrow your definition of framing is. In any case, as evidenced by research, such descriptive labels do affect both sales and how labeled items are evaluated. Granny's homemade apple tart sells better and tastes better than plain old apple pie, as long as the actual products meet the raised expectations. So there you have it, three ways consumers consistently deviate from rational decision making and how marketers can take advantage of it. Of course, there are many more irrational aspects of consumer behavior, and we haven't even gotten started on how wild and passionate emotions impact shopping behavior. But that's a topic for another video. I'll see you there.